Hello, this is Michael Hexter. Welcome to Politics 2100 here on YouTube. This episode I'm calling Pelosi Keeps on Offering Democrats Political Idiocy and Cowardice Packaged as Cleverness, comma, quote unquote, genius. So this is a reflection upon a recent uh, speech that is typical of Nancy Pelosi, um, but also extremely ill-timed and extremely, um, the word corrupt is often applied by people like me who believe in, uh, you know, politics that isn't based on money, but based on votes and, and the persuading the electorate to vote a certain way and, and try to, and leaders trying to uh, do the public service rather than uh, seeing their careers in, in government as a revolving door to uh, higher paying lobbyist jobs and uh, jobs in industry and so forth and so on. So, um, but anyway, corruption doesn't really capture the destructiveness and uh, I would say narcissism of uh, Pelosi's career uh, especially in her role as speaker. And this episode is an example of this uh, pure destructiveness that goes unnoticed by many people. And it goes unnoticed for a number of reasons, which I can get into later on. But let me first describe the speech that she gave at the Aspen Ideas Festival that actually was held not in Aspen, but in Miami. It was held, this was a speech given a couple days ago, so it was after um, the uh, the Roe uh, leaking of the Roe decision um, from the Supreme Court, and so anyway, um, and the, but this this speech shows no signs in a way of being moved by the climate of crisis in among women and among uh, supporters of women's rights and also um, uh, supporters of a uh, pro-people agenda <laughs> and, and a, a progressive agenda, certainly. Um, uh, and <clears throat> anyway, so uh, in this speech, she says again, so this is the maybe the fifth, sixth, seventh time she said publicly that the U.S. needs a strong Republican Party. And she sees her role and the role of the Democrats as those uh, people that are trying to persuade the Republican Party to, quote unquote, I didn't, I'm, this is, these are my words, come to its senses. But essentially, that's what she's saying, that it should return to her imagined position in this in this speech that they were uh, against or they were for climate action, they were for women's right to choose, and that they should, um, uh, you know, return to this supposed tradition in the Republican Party. Um, and and therefore, her, she sees her position, and therefore, and the advisor wise position based on her long experience, she's now in her 80s, um, or early 80s. But anyway, that that uh that one should uh instead as a democratic leader and as a democratic party attempt to reason with uh the republican party rather than fight against them and try to win elections against them so so this speech has takes the form of an excuse of the democratic leadership not to fight and not to campaign um, as a Democratic Party um, and as a, a party that wants to be majoritarian and to win seats away from the, the Republicans. And, and, um, and that she sees, again, she used the word, um, uh, so rather than saying, well, we have to defeat them, she says, no, let's try to persuade them. This is literally her words, okay? I want the Republican Party to take back the party. OK, who that is. Again, this is a which the Republican Party to take back the party. 
Uh, take it back to where you work, where you cared about women's right to choose, you cared about the environment. So there's a number of ways to analyze this uh, rhetoric that she uses in this particular uh, snippet of speech. And, uh, and it's, weave, it's weaved together in a way that um, makes my critique look uh, unfair to her to some degree, or not unfair, but at least that I'm pulling things out of the speech. She, she, she uses the environment and climate as, a, as in a way a distraction from the more, now I think climate is the most, the biggest issue ever, but right now in the United States, the most pressing and mobilizing issue for a base and for the Democrats would be the Roe uh, decision and also just the general, the status of the Supreme Court and the way the Supreme Court has drifted to the far right and, and has essentially become a, a the judicial arm of the Republican Party. And so her, um, so I'm calling this political idiocy and it is political idiocy. I'm I am building on, you know, there's crit criticisms coming from a number of people on the left. Um, Sam Cedar is uh, is criticizing her. Anna Kasparian, um, uh, uh, you know, anybody on the left is going to criticize this speech by um, uh, 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 Pelosi. So it's not like I'm, you know, uh, uh, sticking my neck out by criticizing it. But I'm saying it is actual idiocy. So what she's doing, she is is presenting people with a uh, a strategy that is is a is leading people over the cliff into the abyss, leading the Democrats, leading women, leading um, even though she is a woman, so forth and so on, but leading uh, people who are concerned about reproductive rights, concerned about um, uh, in general the undermining of rights, all kind, not just reproductive rights, the leaked decision or the leaked uh, opinion um, from the Supreme Court suggests that contraception is next, uh, a whole host of issues that are that uh, hinge upon um, the right to privacy. Uh, it's thought that, for, for instance, public education is, is going to be under assault, that there's going to be a full scale assault uh, on a bunch of different rights, not just based on this decision. Um, or the the fundamental the the um, the rights that are being attacked or the decisions that are being attacked in it um, that um, uh, will be you know gay rights uh, will, that will be undermined you know trans rights a whole bunch of different um, rights will be undermined by this decision but that anyway that she is distracting from it and and creating this this fantastic in the sense of uh, fantasy based um, idea about trying to persuade a party that is ruthless and is a, a neo-fascist party and has become that. OK, and so she's using a few shreds of truth about the evolution of the Republican Party in the past. Very, very slight memories of some more Republicans that were pro-choice a few Republicans that were concerned about climate change, a very few, okay? And she's saying that was the, and she's making out as if that was the, the basic consensus of the party when it nev never was, okay? Um, and uh, in the last 50 years, the Republican Party, uh, really even 60 years, you could say, um, uh, has been, um, the reactionary party in the United States, or certainly 50 years, and um, or 53, 54 years, basically after the Civil Rights Act, when the, the Dixiecrats essentially migrated over to uh, the um, Republican Party. And so, uh, and even before then was not the redoubt of, they were the anti-New Deal party. So they, they have opposed progress for uh, the last century. OK, and um, in most case, in most areas. OK, and the uh, so she's creating a fantastic picture of the a, a fantasy based picture of the uh, Republican Party and also abdicating her role as the leader of the, of the Democratic Party. And essentially it's cowardice. This, this is where the cowardice comes in. She is not fighting. She's saying, no, no, we don't have to fight. We have to just have to persuade the um, 
uh, the Republican Party. That will be our action. That will be where the rubber hits the road. We don't need to govern. OK, so this is another issue that the um, the Democrats have is that they 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 try when they get into government, they try not to govern anymore. Or they try to govern. They try to co-govern with the Republicans. They, they try they they push the 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 um, Republicans as far forward as possible as they can or Republican ideas, for instance, Obamacare, which was Romney care. They try to push that f as far forward as if legitimacy in the United States is the the political legitimacy and, and moral legitimacy stems from the Republican Party, that they, the Democrats, cannot independently be a source of ethical action and and legitimacy, political legitimacy, that they that they are of necessity a flawed party. They don't say this, but this is the implication by when in government deferring over being overly solicitous of their opponents who furthermore the opponents who furthermore undermine you at every every um, corner and insult you. OK, and mock you like Mitch McConnell, uh, you know, essentially said he was going to block everything that Obama did and that they that they act as if they have no uh, um, obligation to do anything for the American people. Their role is to just block the Democrats. And the Democrats, meanwhile, beseeching them to work with them, to be their friends, to be to say and also to hear Pelosi saying she wants a strong Republican Party. Now, there is a world, OK, a world of fantasy world in the Democratic sphere and also in of influence and also in the the media, the mainstream media that that dresses this up and makes that a heaps praise on Pelosi that covers over I mean, this. This uh, clip is easy enough to find right now uh, online. OK. And there are certain outlets that have you know put things put things out about it. Newsweek, which is a fraction, small fraction of its what it current what, what it used to be, you know, four or five decades or three, three or four decades ago is now just a, a small website. But it has an article or it has a, a piece on it and so forth and so on. But this particular there's so much um, PR done for um, both Republicans and establishment Democrats um, that try to make them seem uh, like such grand figures and that they can't really do wrong. Uh, and that they, they are so hesitant to um, criticize, be criticized. But anyway, this is and there is the perception in the media. The media tries to create this picture of a bipartisan Washington where these two sage parties get together and that's the most important thing in the world to they're both they must be they're they're respectable so anybody for instance who proposes that well the democrats need to go it alone because they're they're the only party that will stand up for democracy and for working people and for equality and for climate action and so forth and so on in currently in the, in the media environment that we are in especially at the 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 top rungs of the uh, editorial pages and uh, in the placement of articles and the front pages of newspapers or in the way, you know, in the major news magazine uh, shows on cable uh, news and so forth and so on. Uh, the the ethic there is that the Democrats shouldn't um, act on their own, that they that they are incapable of doing this. And the Democratic leadership acts as if that's true. So there's a a media. This is a theme of Politics 2100, uh, which I started the, this vlog because I wanted to expand on on this theme, among other things. But um, uh, where there is this long-standing PR campaign to shield the far right, in particular, and, and to make it seem much more respectable. Um, but part of that is also uplifting people like. Pelosi, who also is constantly is doing the shielding for the far right by saying uh, now she's saying, well, the, the Republicans should take back their party from that, quote unquote, far right. But the thing is, there's no Republicans to do that anymore. There's two or three Republicans who are at the margins of their party, Kinzinger, um, uh, Cheney, 
um, maybe Romney, so forth and so on. And they are not, uh, you know, admirable fighters by any stretch of the imagination, or that they are they're doing some kind of a fight based on some uh, openings they they imagine, or that they are hoping for this change that Pelosi is talking about. But they are they don't have a base in the party. They really they are they are probably on their way ways out. Um, maybe Romney will hold on because of the idiosyncrasies of Utah and so forth and so on. Um, but uh, in, in, in the sense of the culture, it's slightly, uh, it has a Republican culture that is a little bit different than uh, other parts of the nation um, uh, or you know, conservative culture, uh, right-wing culture. But, um, but anyway, um, that all of that is it becomes the it, is inflated in the media that those that small fringe of Republicans that sound semi sane are inflated in the um, mainstream media to make it seem like they're much more important. And you have people who are preaching to that uh, group or imagining it as bigger and so forth and so on. This is and Pelosi is just simply is as the leader of the Democratic Party is joining in on this chorus of saying, let's revive the Republican Party. Look, her role, and this is where it's political, it is idiocy and cowardice and malpractice, okay, is that she should be building up the Democratic Party. She's not doing that. She has achieved the position of the Speaker of the House, which is the second most uh, powerful person in the Democratic Party currently. And if Joe Biden were in president, it would be the most powerful position. And um, she uh, and she's using that. And again, she's not totally I'm criticizing her, but she's expressing opinions that are not far from Joe Biden's at all. In fact, there she is just offering them in a way that is very open in some way. And actually, Biden offers those in, in, in other areas and and he should be criticized equally. But I'm just I'm focusing on Pelosi because in part her tenure is is longer in that position than Biden is in her current position. And also um, because of the relative security of her her, her seat and and then within the party, her seniority, uh, she could hold on to it as long as she wants. Uh, I mean, barring a an uh, a coup inside the party uh, where she is, uh, which I would hope would happen. Um, and, and, you know, uh, but anyway, just to sort of go a little bit into the detail of how she's treated. So she's elevated within the party and she, what she's offering, which seems counterintuitive, it's counterintuitiveness is thought by some people to be genius, to be, clever okay so literally the idea that it doesn't really make sense that she's saying that that the now now some of it is it sounds like she's very you know she's kind of like a i think a, the word is beatific um uh figure she's offering beatitude or offering a sense of uh agape love okay for love for her fellow human being by um by extending the olive branch continually to the Republicans. So therefore, and I think Biden also has a similar uh, uh, approach in, in, in that he thinks that he's going to be rewarded for this um, beatific uh, uh, agape love extended to his, quote, his, his enemies, quote unquote, or at least to people who are trying to undermine him. And he thinks of himself, therefore, as being a magnanimous, big hearted person. It's it's a form of moral narcissism. OK, and the moral narcissism is thick, thick, thick on the ground with Pelosi. So this um, this this uh, this attitude, it, it and it gives in some people, liberal people, a sense of they are they are feel like they are enlarged themselves. They are ele elevated by this sort of this, this, and she acts like a, a very rich lady who, uh, you know, has a sort of a kind of upper class feeling to her. So people identify with that and they think, they, you know, she's above fighting. She's above these things. So, so we think she's so smart and so 
she's coming down from the heights to talk to us okay and this is her her manner when she does it she has this down i'm coming down from the heights to enlighten you on things okay and this so that is thought to be clever it's thought to be smart it's thought to be in the know and and elevated and upper class and so forth and so on meanwhile it is totally undermining uh the democratic party and undermining the um uh, 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 the prospects of the Democratic Party because they need to sa saddle, they need to win the election in 2022 and 2024. And they need to do it based on their own, not on their beatific embrace of the Republican Party, but on the, uh, the merits of what they've done in office or also their promises, what they, that they do in, what they will do in office and the idea that they will serve the public. OK, and they will serve the, the public much better than the the uh, Republican Party. And they need to make that comparison and they need to care more about their voters than, they, than their relationships with the Republicans. Meanwhile, the press and also Pelosi and Biden and others um, act as if their relationships with their uh, Republican peers are the most important thing in the world. Okay. that are that they that that's what counts that's what makes them states people okay and uh so it is it's very masochistic i think for voters to embrace this kind of politician and say oh they're really clever and smart and they really are looking out for us by having this vision and so forth and so on and and people are being brainwashed by the media so i i'm not i don't think it's entirely coming from they're they're being told about how clever and smart Pelosi is, and and many people don't go into detail about you know what she has done and hasn't done, and also that she is really just just uh, undermining the party. And she's she's also I mean I identify with the progressive wing of the party, and she's a a fighter against that that wing. Okay, so she knows how to fight against in, internally against those those uh, representatives. I think are much much better. Uh, than she is and, and so forth and so on uh, and and they're the new generation too or they're not the only new generation but they are overrepresented in the younger um, uh, congress people though there are also miniature Pelosi's and Hoyers and so forth and so on that are younger like Hakeem Jeffries and so forth and so on that are coming up and uh, would be the corporate democrat um, uh, successors to people like Pelosi and Hoyer um, but anyway, uh, the I think that that uh, this this uh, myth of of her cleverness and genius and her is something that is easily debunked. So I will I'll put I am not going to go into detail about it. I, I actually Anna Kasparian did a good segment on Young Turks. I'm going to put the link in the description box uh, of you know basically. Pelosi's shortcomings and so forth and so on as a legislator and also um, beyond that this and also a link to this, this speech that she gave which is simply just a sign of just total just also being totally out of touch um, and 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 it's not it's it shouldn't be charming it shouldn't be uh, um seen as something that's heartwarming or anything by anybody who identifies with a democratic party or with democracy small d democracy in the united states because it this is uh insidious um and and uh um in the sense of undermining it's insidious it's undermining the willingness to fight and the clarity of mind it takes to to draw a line and saying i am against these people I'm going to fight them. I'm going to fight for these principles, these uh, policies, so forth. So on. in this case, let's say, you know, re reproductive rights. And I'm not going to. And just to sort of add in here, which you may know, may or may not know, Pelosi is campaigning for a, an anti-choice Democrat in Texas right now. Um, in fact, she was when this decision was uh, leaked, she was down in Texas or around that time um, campaigning for a corrupt male. OK, Henry Cuellar, uh, sitting congressman 
who is under investigation by the FBI, who's also anti-choice. He has a challenger, who uh, uh, Jessica Cisneros, who has a very good shot of, I hope, and I've been, uh, you know, uh, giving, you know, donating to her and so on and so on. So, I mean, you know, in, in full disclosure uh, to her campaign, uh, and I, uh, if I were down there, I would be volunteering for her. Um, but uh, she is a, she's pro-choice and she is pro-Green New Deal. Uh, she doesn't take corporate PAC money. Um, but that is, that's the, that undermines all of this uh, rhetoric that Pelosi does about being pro-choice or, or all the, the rhetoric surrounding her that uh that that is trying to make her out to be a champion of the issue of the issues that she undermines in her actual work and and that or that she only does uses in a way as a um a fig leaf for her uh role in the good cop bad cop game so she's playing a good cop so so to speak this is the again applying the good cop bad cop framework here she's playing the good cop and she's calling out to the bad cops saying, hey, bad cops, get your act together. OK. And so because we want to need to continue playing the good cop, bad cop game. OK. And you, we need I need you to, to continue to do that. So that's another reframing of this speech that she gives. And it, it makes entire sense what she's saying. Not any it's not sense. It still doesn't. It's still idiocy in the sense of um, what a politician should be doing in our current situation. But in terms of her internal logic, she's trying to recreate this good cop, bad cop, or reconstitute it. It still exists, but she is trying to strengthen it and make sure that uh, it will work for her in, in, and her very much her, her own personal and the parochial uh, interest of the Democratic leadership, the, the very narrow interests of the democratic leadership, economic interests, personal economic interests, and not for the interests of the American people overall. And also in this case, in particular right now, uh, you know, reproductive rights um, and a bunch of other uh, issues like climate change, where, you know, she is called the new green dream. That's that's also uh, Nancy Pelosi about the uh, green, new, uh, green New Deal. So um, anyway, uh, so I'm going to stop here. And uh, again, you know, many of these criticisms can be applied in different forms to Biden and to many other or some other corporate Democratic leadership leaders in the or the Democratic establishment currently, which is corporate dominated in the Democratic Party. Um, but this is a flagrant violation of what I think are fundamental political common sense uh, principles. So anyway, so if you like this video, please like it and uh, it'll put hit the like button. And also please share your comments in the uh, comment section below regarding anything I've said or maybe I've not said in this um, uh, on this topic. And also if you're enjoying Politics 2100, please subscribe and I will see you in the next video.